Hello and welcome to a new video in our Thermodynamics 2 series. Today's video we're going to be talking about the properties of mixtures of ideal gases. Enjoy. So I took the uh, liberty of um, starting off our page there with a few um, concepts to get us started. Um, first of all, uh, you do know already that the ideal gas law is a powerful model um, that's been already shown to be very useful in many of the systems that we've talked about before, specifically gas power cycles and uh, some of the refrigeration cycles as well that uses gases. Um, some examples here are the Brayton cycle or gas turbine engine cycle, as well as many of the piston cylinder gas power cycles that we've talked about, such as the diesel cycle and auto cycle, etc. Um, fundamentally, the ideal gas law relates three of the important state properties that we are often interested in looking at in thermodynamics, specifically the pressure, the temperature, and the density or specific volume of the gas. Um, and it does so. Uh, with a constant of proportionality, if you will, which is the specific gas constant R. That's um, like that over here. You'll recall that this specific gas constant is itself equal to the universal gas constant, R sub U, divided by the molecular mass of the ideal gas itself. So if we're dealing with argon, for example, then the specific gas constant would be the universal gas constant, which is 8,314 joules per kilogram, oh, I'm sorry, kilo, um, kilo mole Kelvin, meaning 1,000 moles Kelvin divided by the molecular mass of argon, which in this case would be 40, approximately 40 kilograms per thousand moles. Uh, and the, that ratio quotient would give us the specific gas constant for argon specifically. And from there on, we could figure out the relationship between pressure, density, and, and temperature of argon, provided, of course, as I've highlighted in the past, that the temperature scale used is an absolute scale only, meaning either Kelvin or degrees Rankine, and that this pressure that we are um, using in the model is also given in absolute unit, um, consistent with the system of unit we're using um, in the SI system, that would be Pascal. Uh, and absolute meaning that we are referencing the pressure um, with respect to a vacuum level or completely evacuated level as opposed to a gauge pressure reading that we often often use as well in engineering. So don't use a relative pressure scale or a relative temperature scale like Celsius or Fahrenheit. You must use absolute units. So I think it's worth highlighting this again as we move forward here. So. Um, the question uh, when we're dealing with a mixture of ideal gases is if I take two of those, two or more of those ideal gases, gases that follow this law that we've just described, and I put them together in a container, can I still consider that combination, that mixture of different ideal gas, itself an ideal gas, and how do I manage that? How do I cast that in the form of my ideal gas law that I've got over here? box it, take of reference, I'm going to call that equation one or main equation here, the ideal gas law. Um, and so uh, back to our question, is that mixture still an ideal gas? And the answer is a resounding yes. And the object of today's class is to um, talk about how we are going to do that. So let's define a few parameters that we're going to use moving forward. Uh, let's let lowercase m sub i represent the mass of a component or a species 
um, the component i, subscript i, in the ideal gas mixture. Let's let lowercase n sub i represent the number of moles of that same component in the ideal gas mixture. Let's denote capital M sub i as the molecular mass or molar mass atom, molar mass of that same component, I in the entire mixture. Okay, so for each individual component, I know it's molar mass, I know the number of moles I have, and I know the total mass of the ideal gas in the total mixture. So with this in mind, based on the definition of each of these terms, that means that I can immediately express the mass of that component mixture is going to be the number of moles of that component in the mixture times its molecular mass, right? So the molecular mass is the mass per unit mole multiplied by the number of moles. I'm going, to, I'm going to get the total number, the total mass of that component in the mixture. Similarly, the total mass of component I, one of the gases in the mixture, or sorry, the total mass of all the components in a mixture is going to be, call it little m of the mixture, simply the sum of all these individual components, right? I got J of them. I'm going to sum them from 1 to J. And J is number of species or what I've been calling components in my mixture. In the mixture. All right. One observation, another observation is that um, the total number of moles in the mixture made up of each of the, the total number of moles of each component necessarily is going to be the same way. N is going to be equal to Um, from I to J of the individual number of moles in a mixture. And so my mixture has a mass of M sub mix and a number of mole of simply lowercase n. So now we're going to define now we're going to define The mass fraction of species I in that mixture as lowercase mf sub I, so mass fraction of I, as the mass of species I divided by the total mass in the mixture. And so, therefore, if I sum all these mass fractions over the entire number of components that I have in my mixture, of course, all these mass fractions should add up to 1. I look at 
mixture in terms of moles. The, I'm going to similarly define the mole fraction of species I. Going to be noted by the letter Y, lowercase y sub I. number of moles of species I divided by the total number of moles in a mixture. And if I'm going to sum up these mole fractions over all of these species that I have in the mixture, once again, just like for the mass, I can expect this to add up to one. It'd be very useful for us to figure out what we've got there going. So, oops, I don't see this yet. So the average molecular mass of the total mixture, everything that's inside the container now made up of a combination of multiple ideal gases, that entire mixture, if I want to treat it as an ideal gas in and of itself, um, it's going to have an average molecular mass It's going to have a sim uh, simply an average molecular mass, which is going to be the total mass of the mixture, divided by the <coughs> call this m sub m sub mix. All right, so let's keep the same thing. M sub mix is going to have a uh, average molecular mass equal to the total mass of everything in the container divided by the total number of moles of gases in the mixture as well. So voila, that's going to be my um, average molecular uh, mass. And that is equal by what we saw before as the sum of product of the number of moles of each individual species in a mixture times their own individual molecular mass, all that divided by the total number of moles that I have in a mixture. So if I take that denominator and move it up in the summation, I can do that because little n alone, the total number of moles, of course, is a constant. So it doesn't depend on i. Express it this way, right? The lowercase m and that's going to be equal to sum over my mole fraction times the molecular mass of each of the species as well so there's another way of figuring out the average molecular mass of my mixture of ideal gases itself a an ideal gas so we've already implicitly um done this before when we've looked at our power cycles uh, because we said we would model air as a, uh, an ideal gas itself. Well, air is not a single compound. It's made of uh, multiple uh, constituents, and these constituents um, are each individually ideal gases, and what we've said is that the combination of them was also an ideal gas. So let's revisit this here uh, with this example here. Um, dry air. So air that's made up of nitrogen, oxygen, and argon in this particular example. <clears throat> um, so air based on a um, on an analysis uh, of, uh, of, of, of average samples in uh, many parts of the atmosphere uh, come up as having a composition that's roughly 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and about 1% argon on average over the entire planet Earth. I recall that 
nitrogen, the atomic nitrogen, has a molecular mass of 14 kilograms per kmol. Um, oxygen has a molecular mass. Let me add the units here to make that absolutely clear. Um, kilograms per kmol. Much rather C units when appropriate than no units and risk some confusion here. Oxygen has a molecular mass of approximately 16 kilograms per kmol. And finally, argon has a molecular mass of approximately 40 kilograms per kmol. Traditionally, these types of um, uh, uh, gas analyses are done on a by volume basis. So imagine that you had a room that's 100 cubic meters. What we're saying is of those cubic meters, if we want to segregate each of the gases, um, nitrogen will occupy 78 cubic meters, oxygen 21, and argon 1. That's what we're saying. Um, and so given um, that the um, molar fraction is equivalent to the vol uh, volume fraction that, that we have uh, when we're dealing with gases, uh, what that means is that each of these percentages that are given are in fact number of moles of each of these three constituents divided by the total number of moles that we're going to have in a specific region where we're mixing uh, these three constituents together. So uh, in the case of, of the atmosphere it would be the, the entire number of moles of air in the atmosphere or any subset of of the atmosphere that we use, for example, to make these to make this analysis. So the uh, number of moles of, say, nitrogen over the total number of moles in our sample size, that would be the mole fraction of nitrogen, Y sub nitrogen. Um, and that would follow the previous rules that we, uh, that we established. So that's true for I being um, nitrogen oxygen or argon so we have three possibilities there so uh, what we're saying then therefore if our goal is to figure out what the mole um, the molecular mass of, of, of air is based on what we found above is that we're going to sum these molar fractions over the total size of our mixture which is three components and we're going to multiply it by the individual molecular mass of each one of those guys so we're going to sum it from 1 to 3, or say nitrogen is 1, oxygen is 2, and argon is 3. And that's going to look like, uh, let's spell it out, the mole fraction of nitrogen times the, oops, no, 2, times the molar mass of nitrogen plus the molar fraction of oxygen times the molar mass of oxygen plus the molar mass of argon, sorry, the molar fraction of argon times the molar mass of argon. All right, so we've already pretty much established what each one of those guys is. The mole fraction is equivalent to the volume fraction, so that would be 78% for nitrogen, and since each individual atom has a mass of 14 kg per kilomole. That means that for the molecular nitrogen, I'm going to be looking at 28 kilograms per kmole. Oops, kmole. Similarly for oxygen, I'm looking at 21%, so that's 0 0.21 times uh, the molar mass of molecular oxygen, which is going to be 16 times 2, or 32 kilograms per kmole. And finally, for argon, I'm going to be looking at 1% times the molecular mass of argon, which is 40 kilograms per kmol. And when I do the math for all this, it's got to be about 21.8 per kmol. It's about 6.72 per kmol. And this is about 0.4 kmol. And we are looking at 28.92 K.
kilograms per kmole of air, which we, we typically approximate as about 29. So, voila, that's where the molar mass of air comes from. In this before, it is simply based on an assumption that air is made up of a mixture of ideal gas, um, and typically that mixture is made up of nitrogen, oxygen, and argon. Um, even if we had simply assumed that the mixture was made of nitrogen and oxygen, we'd rounded it up to the nearest integer, we'd still uh, would have found a molecular mass of 29 kilograms per uh, kmol of air, uh, the component of argon in air being so small that it really doesn't affect the overall mass that much. Um, finally, uh, we can use this result to figure out what the specific gas constant of air is. Right, It's going to be the universal constant times the molecular mass of our ideal gas, which in this case is a mixture of ideal gas, which itself is an, is an ideal gas, and that would be air. So we just figured out what its molecular mass was, so we're good to go. So it would be 8314 joules per k, uh, kilomole Kelvin divided by 29 kilograms per kmol of air, which works out to about 287, 287.5 joules now per kilograms, because the kmol is canceled, uh, times Kelvin. And that is the specific gas constant for air, a very important parameter for a lot of our analyses. All right, let's stop here, and uh, we'll move on next to talk about some of the models in um, some some of the specific models with which we can uh, model these mixtures of gases as well in terms of their individual pressure within a mixture. See you soon. Take care. Mm -hmm.